Excellent. Hello and welcome to Automating Zero Trust for Cloud Native Applications. I'm Aaron Quill. I'm a TMM with SUSE out of San Diego, California, and I have with me... Raul Maikes uh, from Spain, and the same, TMM. Yeah. Uh, I, I specialize on all of our cloud native products as well as Kubernetes. And I specialize on security. So here's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to do an overview of what zero trust really means. We're going to talk about uh, how we actually implement zero trust. We're then going to do a couple of cool demos to show you exactly what you can do. We're going to then have some conclusions, and we'll open it up for Q&A. So I'm going to start with an overview. Actually, Raul is going to start with an overview. Thank you. So zero trust, what is it about? It's basically, it's about not trusting anything uh, implicitly. So everything is blocked uh, by default unless we have uh, explicitly defined it as trustworthy. Uh, this is not a new concept. It has been uh, around for many years, and not only in IT. I mean, here, for example, we don't trust uh, people to cross the door without the right registration and ID. But uh, trust who, what, uh, for doing what, uh, when, and from where, these are questions we should ask to better understand uh, how can we apply this concept to real life scenarios. For example, are we trusting a network packet, a user, a system call? The applications we are using to implement zero trust must be able to identify what we want to focus our policy on. And we also need to define uh, what are we trusting. Is it for the packet to reach uh, application? Um, is it to gain access to some uh, data in our systems? Or is it to execute another application? When we are, oh, sorry. When we are trusting it, um, and I don't mean uh, time, although it could be another variable, uh, like, for example, when it contains a payload with the MySQL protocol, when the credentials are correct, when the application it wants to execute is part of an approved uh, backup system. All this uh, needs to be defined into security policies that will be enforced by a security platform. So, for example, if we want to only allow network packets that use the MySQL protocol to reach my backend application when it's coming from my frontend application. We need software that can uh, see the network packet coming from the, my frontend before it arrives. Uh, if the security platform can act before the packet uh, arrive, it means it's just alerting, not, not uh, protecting. And of course, it needs to be able to see what's inside the network packet, to see if it contains uh, data formatted following the MySQL protocol. Uh, all this and more uh, we need in order to let it go through, decide, for the application to decide if it let it go through or not. Um, we are starting to see this as a complex topic. We can go deeper into it. There are many variables to consider. Uh, another, another challenge, for example, is the Uh, another challenge is to decide what is, uh, it, I mean, to decide for the developers to decide what is useful to look at or, or not. If we, if we make it uh, too complex, it uh, is not very useful because we are humans at the end, so we will be overwhelmed. If we make it too, too simple, it may just give the false uh, sense of protection, but it's actually not uh, so not so secure. Yeah. So the real key to being able to have good security is to automate everything. Because if there's one thing that humans are not good at, it's repeating processes, right? When we rely on humans to repeat processes, they tend to mess things up. They tend to forget steps, or it's very prone to error. The other problem is when we rely on humans, it automatically inserts time into the process, and it slows things down. And what we're really trying to do is make our developers as efficient as possible. So what we really want to do is make it so that as soon as a developer checks in new code, we can automatically bring up that application, run through a test suite to um, profile how the application normally behaves, capture all those things in the profile that he was just talking about, and automatically apply that. So 
as they do a new feature and might change the database they're using on the back end, we can automatically capture that and incorporate it into that security profile. Again, we don't want to slow down development. And of course, Kubernetes is a great place for us to go ahead and insert this automation into because we can see containers spinning up, we can see pods spinning up, we can see the network traffic and everything. And that's really where New Vector comes into play. New Vector gives us the ability to do behavior-based uh, zero trust. So that means, again, learn how the application works, learn all the protocols involved, all binaries that are going to be called, put those in a profile, and use that as the security basis. We Very easy to integrate into CI, CD integration. In fact, we're going to show that later on. We can do incredible things with data loss protection and a web application firewall because we can see directly deep inside the packets and see exactly what protocols are being passed in packets and get actual, you know, if it's an SQL database, we can actually see the SQL call that's in the packet. Uh, we do real-time scanning for vulnerabilities. We do that in multiple different places that we'll cover in a couple minutes. We can, again, leverage all of this technology for compliance and for auditing. And we can also uh, put this and just really use this to lock down what is running on your endpoint. Um, it's also very easy to have multiple clusters all over the world and control these policies from one central location. So the first thing we want to talk about is really protecting against the known, right? Protecting against known exploits that are already out there that are defined in a CVE database um, and just be proactive to make sure none of those known exploits are in any of our systems. So one of the things New Vector does to protect from known uh, problems is to scan in. So we can scan uh, running pods uh, as soon as they start and uh, scan in again uh, if we want as well, and uh, against uh, 12 known CVE databases. We can do the same, uh, scanning on the registry periodically, and uh, we can even uh, scan the host. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I mean, it's really flexible. So, also, we can, uh, New Vector has the ability to uh, do deep packet inspection, uh, which means uh, it can see the actual data that is being sent on the packet. And uh, not only, it, it's not limited to protocols, uh, to layer three and four, like TCP, UDP, et cetera. It's, it can also, understand um, uh, about 30, more than 30 application layer protocols, like MySQL. So you can define policies that look into, into the actual application protocols. Good, right there. And, that, and that's the key here, is we're actually seeing his uh, MySQL call to get all photos in our application. So it really allows us to see exactly what's going in uh, on inside the packets and leverage that for security and compliance. So, so we also use the packet inspection to, to scan for um, non-attacks, um, non for example. And uh, this is by looking, I mean, we can do that, for example, uh, we can detect a SQL injection exploit because we understand the protocol. So that's why it's so important to understand these application layer protocols. Yeah, cool. And we can leverage this for other things as well, specifically things like compliance policy. So this is an application that we built for a customer, and it's an application that sits right on their point of sale devices, right? Right at the cash registers. And what we built was an application that would automatically scan to see if they had an ID that proved that they were part of our customer program, and we would automatically give them a, a discount. Now. This uh, front end is on a device that's going to process credit card transactions. And what we're able to do with New Vector is say, we're going to go ahead and let credit card transactions happen within our environment, but we want to make sure a credit card never goes out to the internet. So what we're able to do is we're able to leverage that deep packet inspection and not just look at traffic, but digging and see what's in that actual packet. And we'll actually look to see if we see credit card numbers and the uh, normal you know, credit card digits with the uh, um, expiration date and everything. If we see that, we're going to do a couple things. We're just going to kill that packet. We're going to drop it off the line. It's never going to get out to the internet. It's never going to get anywhere. We're going to go ahead and make you aware of that. 
we're going to put it in our alert, and we're going to go ahead and uh, write it to the log so that you're aware of what's going on. So now we've, we, we've talked about protecting against the known, right? All the things that are already out there, the exploits that people already know. What about the unknown? What about exploits that we don't know about, that there's not a CVE, or it's something specific for your application? That's really where New Vector shines. So uh, New Vector uh, can protect the unknown by uh, defining the zero trust security policies. These uh, policies are based on the behavior of the application. And uh, to do that, we don't, we don't have to define the, how the application behaves manually. New Vector has a discovery mode, which means that uh, when a process uh, gets executed by the application, I mean by the container, it will detect it and then add it to the, to the security policy. And the same for, for any other thing. And uh, we can also see the network traffic. So how is the application accessing uh, other pods or outside, or how others are accessing? And then, uh, so New Vector will write all this behavior in the policy. And uh, so you don't have to, you don't have to have a deep knowledge of the application. You just need to make sure that you do, you run your use cases on the application because um, the vector needs to see, it observes that how the application works. So it needs to see how it's being used to be able to, to write uh, what, is, uh, what is the application doing. So once you have this um, policy defined, you can review or, and you can set it uh, to monitor mode. Monitor mode will get this uh, security policy and uh, just uh, uh, observe what is happening and alert of what is not uh, a behavior defined in the security policy. So for example, now the, the, the application, the container tries to run a curl command. Uh, New vector sees that it's not in the policy, and then generates an alert. It doesn't stop the chain of, of events, and this is uh, this is important because if you are missing something on the policy, or you want to see what happens, uh, if uh, it stops, uh, you will not see what is going. I mean, what is, what will happen further? Yeah, the, the, the key so. is you put it in discovery mode, you create your profile, and then because you don't want to just lock everything down, you run it in monitor just for a short time to make sure you really captured everything. You didn't miss one of those binaries that's being called or one of the packets that's being passed on the network. Yeah, if, if you're not, not sure you have captured all the use cases, you can set up in monitor mode for a while, let the users do their things, and see if you have missed something. And then we have the protect mode. The protect mode basically does the same. It will generate an alert. But instead of uh, just uh, letting go through, it will just kill it. I mean, any behavior that is not in the policy, it will be stopped. Cool. So, so let's talk about the uh, actual implementation. Uh, we typically, well, here's, here's the key. Uh, we are a privileged pod that's running on all of your actual hosts. We are not a sidecar, right? Uh, we use all of the servers as intermediaries between the applications, the source, and the destination. Uh, that's one of the keys because what we have the ability to do is to um, attack the network packets before they even get to the next host. So it's not the host waiting for that bad packet to get there. We've killed it before it's even gotten there. If we look at what we actually put on each machine, we have a scanner, and that's the technology that we use for scanning for the known. That's the one that's linked up with the CVE databases that's going to do all of the scanning as every single container is spun up, as well as, as he mentioned, periodically going through our registry. Then we have the enforcer that's also running on all the different nodes. That's where we're really using to lock down the profiles. And there's one key thing that I want to point out here. The enforcer is not running in Kubernetes as far as we're not just looking at Kubernetes pods being spun up and containers within pods, we're looking at all containers on the host that are running. And that's really key 
If you think back a couple years ago, there was an exploit that allowed people to kick up containers running on hosts that Kubernetes didn't see. The great thing is with New Vector, we would see that rogue container spinning up and we'd be able to shut it down. Uh, you can see all the traffic uh, network, I mean all the network traffic. And uh, this is also important because so for performance, you don't need to have a sidecar on every, on every pod. So it scales really well. That's one of, one of the key things, too, is performance. Because normally when we talk to people about new vector, they hear about the profile, they hear about looking at all the processes and all the network, and they immediately go, oh my gosh, did this slow everything down? No, we're talking about a couple percentage. You know, 3% slowdown, maybe. It's very, very fast and very, very efficient. So now, after we've gone and we've created our profiles and we've really defined how the application works, we need some way to get those updates out to all of the clusters in our node. So that's where we're going to use a piece of uh, open source technology called Fleet. And what Fleet allows us to do is to uh, point Fleet to a GitHub repo, and that GitHub repo will store whatever it takes to deploy your application. So it might just be uh, Kubernetes YAML files. It might be Helm charts. It might be customized that's modifying those Helm charts before it installs. But you point it to a repo, and then all you need to do is tell it what clusters you want to uh, go ahead and put this application on. So you just select the clusters that you want to uh, uh, assign it to, and of course that's normal Kubernetes stuff. It can be based on tags or whatever, or labels. We apply it, and then it's going to go ahead and be installed on all the clusters. One of the key things is the way that Fleet is architected, the Fleet downstream cluster is the one that periodically connects to Git repo to check to see if there's an update. So that's how we get the killer scalability. It's not a centralized place putting all uh, or pushing all the changes down. Each individual downstream cluster is regularly checking to see if there's updates. So now let's go ahead and talk about our actual implementation. Yeah, so so we are gonna, now we are going to run through the process of creating a security policy for your application with New Vector. Um, we will make uh, sure new vector is in learning mode, and then we'll run some use cases. Basically, do everything a normal user will do with your app. And then uh, we'll turn the policy to monitor mode, just to show you how it works. I mean, it's actually not needed, but. Um, after that, we'll show you how, to, how we can tweak it and harden. And then finally, we will export it and, uh, to, for the, um, for, to automate it, basically, to automate the deployment. So, so we will navigate to, to the policy and groups. This is where New Vector stores the zero trust policies. And then here we will filter by your application namespace and uh, examine the development version of our application, which is Web Photobook Dev. A policy with predefined rules exists already because New Vector actually generates one every time a, a new uh, pod is deployed. Um, Note the policy type on the right. Uh, our production version is, uh, says, CRD instead of learner. This indicates that the policy has been auto-loaded during our CI-CD process. Now, switching to the application's web UI, let's engage in various user activities. Let's, let's do things with the application, like upload a picture, um, edit an existing one, you really run through everything your application normally does so that we can capture all traffic, every binary of call, and everything. Yeah, we, we are using the application so that new vector knows how it behaves. And then if we go back to new vector and hit refresh, we can see it have created a few more rules based on what we were doing with the application. So the network rules here we see it was not there before. Some SH, I mean running bash. And then we are going to switch to monitor mode. And we will go to the console. And we will run a few commands, which um, is not the normal behavior for the application. We are, we are just doing this for you to see. So we log in into the container and just 
do run things. So if we go back to new vector in notification, security events, we filter by our application. Um, well, we already see a bunch of alerts complaining about the processes not included in the security policy, like df, the command we run, and some other commands which are part of the, I mean, it's not what we execute, but it's part of the process. So if we think one of these processes is legitimate, we can simply add it to the security policy by clicking review the rule and then deploy. And back to the policy, we can also tweak it via the UI. I mean, we can add it manually if we want, or we can just edit the YAML file. I mean, it's no, no, no secret. And you may wonder why harden? I mean, is, isn't all automatic? Well, the new vector approach is to make the policy robust without making it uh, too complex. So for instance, we could add a rule for each external host connecting to the app, but that would be unmanageable. If we are certain about which uh, specific IPs or hosts are gonna connect to the application, we can, we can define it in the policy. The same applies to files. Why don't it add any files? Because the no application normally you know, touch a, a lot of files, access a lot of files, etc. So it, it will be overwhelming. And besides that, Novator has this uh, zero drift mode, which prevents uh, file system drift in the container. And also it has a set of default uh, file location it monitors by default. So to conclude this part, we will export the policy in protect mode. And uh, as you can see, it's just a YAML file. It can be edited. Uh, you can import it later on on the UI via the UI, or you can just with kubectl apply. Cool. So next we want to do, so we've created the profile, we've got our application, we've got it sitting in a Git repo. So what we want to do next is we want to show you how we can use Fleet to automatically deploy that on all of our downstream clusters. So we're going to go in, I'm going to show you how to configure Fleet. We're going to prepare uh, our resources. We're going to show you what the resource structure looks like and then upload everything to the repo. Cool. All right. So the first thing we're going to go do is we're going to go to the application repo where we've stored all of the fleet files as well as all of the dev apps that we need to actually create our environment. The first thing we've got is this fleet cattle YAML. And what that does is it gives us the instructions on how to monitor the Git repo, how often we're going to check it, and what contents to execute. So this is what the YAML looks like. You see the kind is a Git. There's the web app, the name of the application we've defined. The namespace here, you use fleet local if it's a single cluster. You use fleet default if it's going to be a multi-cluster environment. Um, next thing is the actual repo uh, where our code resides. So here you can see we've just got something stored on Git. And that's where we're normally going to pull it. You define the branch. Uh, we're using main. Forewarning, we default, like a lot of things, to the old default of master. So when I'm talking to people, this is normally the first thing that people get wrong is they don't put their branch in proper. But I'm sure we've all done that. Um, and then you get to specify what path underneath that Git repo where all the manifests are going to reside. Um, you can have many applications in a single repo. Here we've just got one. And then the target namespace is the namespace that the application is actually going to be installed on on the downstream uh, cluster. So it's really easy to define this. And um, we can have multiple clusters. We can do canary deploys and all sorts of things. All right, so now let's go ahead and take a look at the manifests themselves. So we're going to go into that manifest, manifest folder in GitHub. And we see two YAML files here. The first one is the setup of the application, and the second one's that new vector security policy. So if we go ahead and we take a look at this uh, setup YAML, we can see there, really, it's, it's a normal YAML, right? It's what we're used to seeing every day. It defines our application. Um, just the standard Kubernetes YAML will have services and everything defined in there. And it's really everything we need for the environment. And then here's the new vector security policy that he automatically created, right? He just did the one that he created in the UI and exported it. 
And then here's a, just a uh, GitHub workflow that we defined so that whenever we see updates and we see an updated version number, we're going to generate the new version and make an update. And then Fleet will detect it, and all downstream clusters will go ahead and grab it. So we are, we are going to do a demo. Um. Yeah, we're, we're going to do a demo as soon as he gets his mouse working, where we're going to do an upgrade to the application, right? We're going to be a developer, we're going to make a change to the application, then we're going to go ahead and profile that change and update the security policy. Okay, so while we were talking, our application developers have been working hard to make a major upgrade to my app. So my app used to work uh, using a local file as database, and now it's going to use a remote database. And uh, the development team, of course, wants to make sure the application will continue to run protected in production. So we're going to test the upgrade in development first. So we go to new vector policy. The external database, MySQL, uh, has been configured already and is being protected by new vector, as you can see. So our application running on development also has been upgraded already. And we uploaded the existing security policy, but uh, it's still using the local database. So we are going to, well, this is the new version. We are going to change the settings to use the remote database and see what happens. We log in with the admin credentials to change the settings. And uh, here, using DB type, we change from SQL little to MySQL. Uh, at the same time, we are running some automated tests in the background, covering all these use cases we were doing before manually. So new vector logs should show if any of the new features require a change in the policy. And it's currently in monitor mode, so nothing is going to be blocked. So we're going to see that this is the test, uh, the test we are running. I mean, very simple shell script. So using curl to to do what we were doing on the web UI. And uh, it's basically, we use it in the, we add it as a lifeless uh, prof in the deployment. So here you can see, test. I mean, something really simple. So now in new vector, if we go to notification, security, events, now, we can see that the security policy is warning us the application is not behaving as expected. You see this, these two lines, alert. So it's trying to establish a network connection to, a MySQL, to the MySQL container in the MyApp dev namespace using MySQL application protocol on the port 3306 TCP. So we are going to update the policy to allow this new connection. We already spoke with the developers, and all this is expected. So it's not. Uh, now we see the policy, and we can see the this uh, the rule has been added to the policy. Now we will export the updated policy, edit to have it the correct names because this is for development and uh, add it to the Git repo fleet is monitoring for production. So once we add it, uh, it fleet will detect the change and then it will deploy the new, uh, the new version. So for production application image is already in the registry. We, we set up the external database, protected by new vector and all the data is migrated. So basically the environment is ready for fleet. And here is the rancher interface for fleet. And we can see he has successfully deployed the new version together with the updated security policy. If we go to my app, we can see it's the new interface and it's set up to use uh, MySQL as external database. Now we're gonna go back to the main page.
Oh, wh okay. Wait a minute. Wh what is this? The app is not working. Is I is enabled to connect to some database random.com? This is this is not right though. Configuration seems to be changed. Somebody changed it? Did you change it? Uh, no. I didn't change anything. Let me check that. Let, let's go to new vector and see what happened. We can see in the logs the application is trying to connect to this external database we never heard about. Luckily, New Vector stopped uh, the application from connecting to this database, so we are safe. Uh, here, here's a Slack net message here that says the, the developers found a bug in the application. Hmm. And they're going to try to fix it. They just can't get a hold of anyone. Oh, Somebody so forgot to set up authentication on that API so anybody can go in and change the database. That's bad. How long it will take to fix it? Well, the problem is all the developers are at KubeCon, so we don't have access to them. We've got one person who's not at KubeCon, but they're at lunch, and we have no idea how long it's going to be before they come back. He went to a spicy hot pot, right? Yeah, Never and we haven't seen him. Yeah. OK, so maybe we can do something with New Vector? Yeah, it, and that's what's cool, is we can use that uh, web application um, firewall to go ahead and define something to stop and change going to that API. Yeah, so yeah, we will, use, we will create some rules to prevent, um, uh, to prevent clients from accessing the API. I mean, the part of the API that has the bug. So here, we are creating a new sensor. And now we are going to add a new rule, which uh, basically with, we can put a pattern. And then New Vector will inspect the packet looking for that pattern in the URL. And uh, if it finds it, it will just uh, block it. So here is uh, API settings. This is the, the part that has the bug. Here we say it's a URL. And we add it. So we create this sensor. And now we're going go to go back to the policy groups. Go to our my app dev security policy, because we're doing in dev first. And in WAF, we will add the one that we just created. So now it, it should be blocking the, the request. But well, first, we need to switch it to protect mode, because now it's in monitor, so we switch to protect. And now this is the, the old uh, API uh, query. So we can see after we refresh, it we can no longer access the API URL. I mean, the one that has the bug. Actually, all the API has the bug, but it's. Uh, so here in the events, we can see it's being uh, blocked. So you see the action, the name means block. And uh, we can see more information about the packet itself. We can inspect the packet itself. I mean, and we can even download it if we want. So le let's try to do, because this is a HTTP get, that we try to do with HTTP POST to make sure it's uh, working everything. So it cannot go through. So I think it's good to, uh, to apply it in production until the developers find a fix. Cool. Mm. So the, the key to that is we found a bug in the application. We couldn't get a hold of the developers to plug the security hole. We were able to do it purely through our new vector profile, and, and that's and using the uh, web application firewall. So it's great we were able to stop a security hole without hitting our developers, block it until they come back. Mm. And this applies to any application. Sometimes you use applications, you don't have control, you don't have a source code, doesn't matter. And uh, another key thing is we are using all open source, nothing, no paywalls, nothing, uh, some are CNCF projects. And uh, here in these uh, pages, you can, well, you can see the source code and some documentation for new vector, fleet. And also in the last repository, we will place all the materials we use for this presentation so you can uh, play with it and investigate. Awesome. 
And we also uh, have a demo uh, running down in the Rancher booth. So you can come down and see us in the Rancher booth. We'll talk to you about it, show it to you and everything. And with that, oh my god, we're 25 seconds early. I just want to point out I've never, ever ended a talk anywhere close to on time. So we have 20 seconds for questions. Questions? All right. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, everyone, and have a good QCon.